And now the C-SPAN series, The Contenders, is live from Augusta, Maine. From hill and from mountain, from valley and plain, to the length and the breadth of Columbia's land, on the wings of the trees and the voice of the breeze comes the shout of the gathering band. From north and from south and from east and from west, from the lakes and the oceans and seas, resounding on high in the rally. You're looking at some of the images from the 1884 presidential election and listening to a campaign song in support of that year's Republican nominee, James G. Blaine of Maine and his running mate, John Logan. Tonight, our Contender Series continues and we're live from the Blaine House in Augusta, Maine, home of James G. Blaine and, uh, since 1920, the official residence of Maine's governor. We're inside the Blaine House with Maine sitting governor, Paul LePage. Governor, this house is filled with Blaine memorabilia. Do you have a sense of the man while you're here? Absolutely. And first of all, welcome to Maine and welcome to the People's House. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Blaine is here every day and we see his spirit every evening because we always say good night to him. What is your sense of living among, I mean, the house was built many years ago. Many people have lived in it over the years, but he really is present in a lot of ways. What have you come to learn about the man by living in his midst? He not only was a uh, very strong supporter and founder of the Republican, Republican Party in Maine, but a national leader and started Maine on its course to where we are now. And very, very influential, both in the press in state government, federal government. Um, man was a very powerhouse, big time powerhouse on the national scale and uh, very proud to be honored to be allowed to stay here and be a steward of the house for the next four years. Well, as governors go, you probably have the best commute in America because it's right across the street from the Capitol building. It's great. If he was here today, though, I'd ask him to put a tunnel under the road. But... <laughs> and maybe better air conditioning as well. <laughs> well, we're, uh, we're really pleased to be here tonight to learn more about uh, James G. Blaine. I know for many people, he's really faded into the pages of history, but tonight we're going to learn more about the man who brought the Republican Party to the state and about your state and that time period. Thanks for hosting us. Well, thank you so much. And again, welcome to the state of Maine and to the People's House. Thank you. We're going to be live for the next hour and a half learning more about James G. Blaine's America and about the Republican Party that he was so influential in bringing to this state. Uh, we're going to be moving into the reception room here at the governor's mansion. Two guests are waiting for me and they will be my guests throughout the program. While we're getting set up in there, I'm going to show you a clip from a roundtable discussion that C-SPAN hosted. Presidential historian Richard Norton Smith talks about James G. Blaine and his times. We'll see you in just a minute or so. 1884 against Cleveland. Uh, yes. and, and before that, he'd run for the Republican nomination. And, and ironically, in 1876, it was Blaine who prevented Ulysses Grant from coming back, uh, or rather 1880. It was Blaine who prevented Ulysses Grant from making a comeback and winning a third term. Besides being Secretary of State for James Garfield and for uh, his... And Chester uh, Arthur. Chester Arthur. And what Benjamin did, Harrison. He was Secretary of State under three presidents. What else did he do? Did he, was he elected to another government? He uh, was in Congress. Uh, he was Speaker of the House. He was a very effective, yeah. iron-willed speaker. He changed some of the rules in, in the House. Um, I'm not sure exactly which rules they are. It seems to me Speakers of the House um, are always changing rules somewhat to their advantage. But, uh, you know, a smart, capable guy, but... Corrupt, probably. And, and remember, this was the period after the Civil War when Congress was much more central, yeah. uh, much more potent than it had been. The reaction against the strong executive set in. So to be Speaker of the House, uh, to be a power in Congress uh, in the 1870s, 1880s, meant a lot more than perhaps it would today. Mr. Cannon, do you have anything to say about Mr. Blaine? Well, I was I would, curious about Richard. What do you think would have happened had he won? How would, how would he have changed? I, I think he would turn out to be, well, put it this way, I think he would be regarded as the best president between Lincoln Very and uh, T.R. Because he was, he was assertive, because he had intellectual heft, because he had 
He had a lot of talent. And I think once he had actually achieved, people are consumed by, and they, they lust after the presidency. It's a distorting, warping malignancy that they suffer from. And if they survive it, and they win the office, and uh, you know, I think Blaine is someone like Clay. Clay and Blaine have a great deal in common. Uh, They're both very charismatic, polarizing figures who I think in office would have distinguished themselves. And as promised, we are in the reception room at the Blaine House. So let me introduce you to our two special guests who will be with us for this program. Uh, Earl Shuttleworth is Maine's state historian, and he's also the director of Maine's Historic Preservation Commission. Thanks for being here. Elizabeth Leonard is the chair of the history department at Maine's Colby College and is an expert on the Civil War region, a re, uh, era of history. L let me have you set the stage for us about 18, mid 1880s America. We're 20 years past the Civil War. What was the country like at that time as we're going into this election in which he was a contender? Well, I'd start by saying that we're a long ways past the Civil War in many ways, and I think that's indicated by the fact that there is going to be a Democratic president that is elected that year, and that would have been unthinkable just a short time before that. So that's one thing to say. Why would it have been unthinkable? Because the Republicans were the winners of the war and they had controlled the government for a long time and they had controlled Reconstruction. And it feels to many people like a handoff to the South to let the Democrats come into the White House. Now I'm going to stay with you for a second because Maine is your expertise, but talk to me about North and South America, uh, uh, the country, excuse me, Northern and Southern states, and the difference in the economies. Well, the, the Civil War had, of course, crushed the economy in the South, and so one of the key goals of Reconstruction was to get the economy up and running again, and that was largely on the way to success, certainly by the middle of the 1880s. But it is on, I would say, very much northern terms how the South is being rebuilt. James G. Blaine was a powerhouse uh, by 1884, known internationally as well as nationally. But Maine really hadn't been in the Union all that long. I mean, how... how yeah. Well, Maine had out? originally been part of Massachusetts since the colonial times, uh, became a state in 1820. We went into the Union as the 23rd state. We were part of the Missouri Com uh, Compromise. Uh, Missouri was slave. Maine was free. And by the post-Civil War period, uh, Maine had initially suffered a bit of a setback during the Civil War. We'd sent about 70,000 men to the war, about 10,000 had been lost and our population in that uh, decade of the 1860s actually did not grow but by the period of the 1884 election Maine was really getting back on its feet Maine has always had wonderful uh, resource based industries and so we had we had ice we had granite we had lumber uh, we also had textiles we had shoes uh, and Blaine really was very much a part of and a beneficiary of this very robust economy at the time. Oh, he contended against the Democrat Grover Cleveland, who won first and then sequentially later, uh, non sequentially later on. Uh, the Republican Party that nominated him, this was his third try for the White House, unsuccessful to get even the nomination the two times earlier. What was the key to his success in securing the nomination in 1884? Well, persistence always is part of, the, part of the story, I suppose, and to continue to try as he did. And he was certainly recognized as a leading, leading figure in the Republican Party. There's no question. I mean, one of his many nicknames was Mr. Republican, and he was certainly a leading figure, so that would be part of the story. He also had some great enemies at the time who were trying to deny him the nomination. So explain the split in the Republican Party, uh, if, you, if you will, please. Yes, well, there, there were uh, a group of, uh, of moderate uh, they were called in 1884 the Mugwumps, uh, and they were in many cases the intelligentsia from Boston, from New York, from Philadelphia. Uh, these were uh, folks who believed that Blaine was a very corrupt individual. Uh, you think, for example, of Henry Adams, who wrote Democracy, and the senator in Democracy, uh, who was a dark figure, is, is James G. Blaine, who modeled upon him. So he did have very strong uh, enemies, even with his own party. Ultimately, this was a very close election. Will you tell me about the results? Well, I think he only uh, loses by 30 or 40 electoral votes. Is that correct? Yes, and the actual vote itself, uh, 10 million people vote, uh, and he loses the election by 25,000 votes nationally.
and the key to the loss is the loss of New York State, uh, about a thousand votes. And New York State was also the place where a rising star, young star, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, was beginning to make his presence known. Was he an influence in the outcome of the election? Well, he was considered uh, a mugwump, one of the one of the liberals, and uh, indeed that is a trend that begins his career in that direction, uh, at least into the 1890s. Now, what's interesting about the 1884 election that has some echoes of today is that it was highly personal. Highly personal. In a way, we often today don't think 19th century politics were, but they were very personal, especially starting with Andrew Jackson, I'd say things get very personal. And this is a very, it's really in many ways a fight about Blaine as a corrupt politician, but then perhaps Cleveland had a child out of wedlock somewhere in the country and, and so on, and they're slinging nasty mud at each other. There's two phrases that most even high school students uh, study in their history books that are from this campaign. First of all is the phrase rum, Romanism, and rebellion. Where did, who said it, where did it come from, and why was it so important in the campaign? Uh, that was uh, uh, a minister named Burchard, and about a week before uh, the election, uh, he gave a talk that uh, Blaine was uh, party to, uh, in which he denounced the Democratic Party as the party of rum, Romanism, and rebellion. Rum, uh, prohibition, uh, Romanism, the Roman Catholic Church, and rebellion, the South. Uh, and that phrase was carried quickly by the Telegraph and the newspapers all over the country, and it's one of the phrases that apparently contributed to Blaine's loss. And isn't the problem that Blaine didn't denounce it? No, I mean, that was no. one of the things. So people believed that that was, many people actually thought he had said it is what That's I understood, right. and rather yes. it's just that he really didn't denounce it. And affected the New York Catholic vote in the end? Very Absolutely. Very much so. Yes, Absolutely. right. The other, uh, was there a, 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 an anti-Catholic mood in the country in some sectors? Yeah, oh, certainly, even still. You know, there had been since the 1840s when the Irish first were immigrating in such large numbers, and some would say that anti-Catholic sentiment went farther back than that. But yes, and I think that persisted too. And there was, and the prohibitionists, the temperance movement was also rubbing up against that as well. The second phrase, and you alluded to this on uh, Grover Cleveland's side, is ma, ma, where's the <laughs> The rejoinder to that is gone to the White House, ha, ha, ha. What was that all about? Well, that's about this accusation that, Bla that I'm sorry, that Cleveland had a child out of wedlock somewhere, and, and in fact, that he was not the moral upstanding man that could be set up to challenge the corrupt and devious Blaine, right? Mm -hmm. Now, he chose a tactic, as, as I read, which was not to deny. Right, and, mm. and apparently to pay child support, to find the child or, and uh, pay yes. for its orphan, pay mm -hmm. for the child in the orphanage. So a lesson perhaps for modern politicians. <laughs> right at it, Just head on. out and admit it. Uh, I also have a book here uh, because uh, Obviously, the media, the newspapers were partisan at the time, but this is a book that James G. Blaine wrote, 20 Years of Congress, which helped set the stage for his campaign, I understand. And he, this was very well received. Yes. Um, the first volume, he began to write it in 1881, I think shortly after he was uh, Secretary of State for the first time. Uh, and it, the first volume was published in 1884, maybe just in time for the campaign. The second volume didn't appear till 1886. However, uh, it was a highly popular uh, two-volume bestseller, apparently sold tens of thousands of copies. And it was his personal account of his experiences in Washington from the time of the Civil War to the early 1880s. And he made a lot of money from this. He did indeed. Was it one of the reasons he was able to buy this house, do you know? Yes, I, I think it contributed to that. Um, uh, well, not, not this house, though. The house that we're now in actually goes back much earlier. Um, in 1862, which is a critical year for him, uh, he's Speaker of the Maine House of Representatives, and at the same time, uh, he's also running for Congress for the first time. And it's in 1862 uh, that he buys this house for $5,000, uh, and he and his wife, Harriet, move in with their family. Uh, this house had been built just a few years before in the 1830s by a retired sea captain. Uh, and this becomes his great political center for the rest of his life. In, in other words, he hosted many dignitaries here, had lots of meetings here. Well, what you have to bear in mind is that in 1859, Blaine becomes uh, the chair of the Republican Party in Maine. And it's a post he holds until he becomes Secretary of State in 1881. In that 20 or so year period, this house is 
election central for the Republican Party in Maine, as well as the springboard for his national campaigns. And if people could see, the state capitol is right outside right. our windows here. Yes. Yeah. So he, the parking lot is across the street from the state capitol. It capitals. was a very dis strategic decision to acquire this house in the and location. And I believe Ulysses right Grant visited here, isn't that He correct? did indeed, he did. yes. He stayed for stayed a here. couple of days. Yeah. Well, I want to tell our viewers that uh, we're going to um, invite you in in a little bit in the conversation here. In our Contender Series, we're looking at 14 men, and they are all men, given the, the presidential election process in this country, uh, who were candidates for president in their time, did not succeed in the quest for the White House, but still had an outsized influence on American history. James G. Blaine, someone who was, as I mentioned at the outset, really known internationally, uh, but has really fallen behind in the history books. So we're going to spend some time tonight digging into his what, what made him so well known and really why he en ended up failing in his bid for the White House. Uh, our phone lines will be open. We'll take calls probably about 20 minutes past the hour, and we welcome your questions or your comments or your additions to our discussion of history of the Gilded Age in America and uh, the burgeoning Republican Party and its influence on American life. Well, I mentioned that uh, we are um, going to be talking about some of his other campaigns. And uh, I wanted to start with, go back to 1876, uh, which is the first time he ran for the White House. He was nominated at that time uh, at the convention by someone who coined a term, the Plume Knight, a gentleman by the name of Robert Ingersoll. Do you know any more about Ingersoll and about that speech and why the phrase stuck? Well, my understanding of that speech is that it is a defense of Blaine against accusations of corruption in connection with the railroad industry. And that that was how uh, Ingersoll wanted to introduce him to demonstrate that not everybody believed that he was as corrupt as he, some people had come to think he was. Why did the phrase stick? Did it speak to something about James G. Blaine? I suspect it spoke. I, he seems to have been a kind of person who really uh, had great admirers and tremendous enemies and detractors. And I think his admirers thought he was a great hero. Well, I think also uh, it was kind of a label that stuck because in the cartoons of the day, both mm -hmm. pro and con, uh, the plume knight was a wonderful image to create. I mean, there was a lot of interest still in romantic literature, in old English literature, and he was often shown either in Elizabethan costume or in uh, a knight in shining armor. It was a perfect kind of image for him. And we are looking at one of the political cartoons you've brought along. How important were political cartoons in affecting the electorate in that age? They were, they were tremendously important. Uh, this was a period in which pictorial publications abounded in America for the first time. They were very widespread, very easily produced. And in the case of the political journals, you had uh, The Judge, which was pro-Republican, and Puck, which was pro-Democratic. And in the pages of those magazines, this one that we're seeing now comes from uh, The Judge. It's a pro-Blaine uh, cartoon, which shows Blaine uh, as uh, the, the, the sort of learned elder statesman in his plume knight costume, his Elizabethan costume. Uh, and all all around him uh, are letters from states all over the country begging him to uh, become president of the United States. So it's, a, it's definitely a pro uh, uh, campaign uh, cartoon. Now you told us about the mug bumps in 1884. Colorful names for factions in the party back in 18, uh, 1876 include uh, the half-breeds and the stalwarts. Right. Yes. The half-breeds referring to those Republicans who did not support Ulysses Grant and the stalwarts referring to those who did, if I'm not mistaken. Exactly. Right. Yep. And which faction was James G. Blaine a part of? The half-breeds. And what happened at the convention that he was not successful in getting the nomination? Well, essentially, uh, a short time before, uh, the Mulliken letters were revealed, uh, and uh, that created a, a big scandal for him. Uh, the Mulliken letters involved uh, a very questionable stock deal involving one of the railroads, uh, and uh, that clouded the picture for him uh, in 1876. Nomination went to? James A. Garfield. And uh, Blaine recognized that this was happening at the convention. Uh, he actually was, uh, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, actually in 76 it went to Hayes. Rutherford B. Hayes. Right. That's mm -hmm. right. Right. Yes. 80 was Garfield. He ran again in 1980. Were, were the factions still that we talked about, the half-breeds and the stalwarts, still very active in the party by then? I'm not so sure that they no. had the, those uh, 
terms anymore that they were thinking in the same, along the same lines. There were still, of course, divisions within the party. That year, James Scarfield did get the nomination. Yes. Thanks to Blaine in many ways. And can yes. you explain why? Well, because Blaine, although he very much wanted that nomination himself, came after many, many ballots, if I'm not mistaken, to understand mm -hmm. that that About was not going to happen. <laughs> I think it was the 36 ballots. Something like that. Yeah. And so he threw his votes to Garfield in order to make sure that he would get the election. And then what happened to him after that? Became Secretary of State in 1881. Now, James Garfield, of course, was struck by an assassin's bullet in 1881. I read that, that James G. Blaine was actually with him in the train station. Right. Yes. He was. Do you yeah. know the story? I know that he was nearby and that they were walking arm in arm. They were very good friends, although Garfield had... I remember reading something that said Garfield never quite trusted his friend James Blaine. But they were good friends and they were together at that point. And he was sending him off on the train to head north, I believe, to give some speeches. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to uh, spend a little bit of time before we uh, get to calls learning more about Blaine's character. We've alluded to some of the suggestions about uh, corruption and the like, but before we get to that, if he were to walk into this room today, uh, what, what did he look like? What did he sound like? What were some mm. of the things that you know uh, from your study of the man? Well, I think he was considered uh, a very handsome man, uh, very well dressed, uh, extremely well spoken. Uh, beginning in the late 1850s, of course, he had started out his career here in Augusta as a newspaper editor, uh, but uh, got bit by the political bug, and uh, by the late 1850s uh, was very much immersed in the emerging uh, Republican Party. Had lots of experience in the late 1850s and the 1860s uh, in stump speaking here in Maine, and that really gave him uh, a lot of practice uh, toward being able to uh, articulate his ideas uh, as he emerged as a national figure. Uh, charismatic magnetism was another word attached to him right. in that period. Right, and, and I know that I I, my understanding is that he had a terrific memory for people's names, so that he was the kind of politician who could really make you feel that he knew who you were, what your particular concerns were, and so on, and that made him a very powerful figure. You know, there's a story told, for example, when he's in the 1884 campaign, uh, he's on a, on a train, uh, and uh, he recognizes a man who he had met uh, as a wounded soldier in a military hospital in Washington 20 years before. So that was the kind of memory he had for faces. What a gift for a politician. Yes. Right. To, to be able to memorize our names and recall them. So he really was able to capitalize that in his chosen career. He was career. a great politician. Yes, a master. <laughs> a master. Not yeah. just in that, but also in his mastery of political tactics. Mastery of political tactics, uh, mastery of controlling his party and leading his party, mm -hmm. I would say. And, and there is a sense that as uh, when he was in Congress during those years that he wrote about, which were critical years for the nation, he did have a way of trying to smooth over some of the terrific differences between the sections and as Congress was coming back together to include the South and so, so on. Some of the references I read about him, though, mercurial, mm -hmm. hyp hypochondriac, prone to depression, bouts of depression. Can you verify having read these sorts of things, too? Oh, oh, very Absolutely. much so. Yeah. He, was, he was constantly complaining of, of ill health uh, all through his life and, of course, um, ultimately uh, died at, at, at 62 in 1893. Uh, and the last few months of his life, he, he was truly ill. He had uh, Bright's disease, I think. He Correct. Right. Succumbed yeah. to. He was also relentlessly ambitious. And I know that I read someone who said... Uh, there was nobody who yearned or who hungered for the presidency more than James Blaine. Throughout his career, though, the, the cor charges of corruption from uh, his days promoting the railroad lobby in Congress uh, stuck with him. We have another one of these political cartoons, the tattooed uh, James G. Blaine, uh, which refers to, uh, on the tattooed man, many of the charges against him. Will you tell us more about that episode yeah. and why it was so significant? Yes, this comes from Puck, and this is from the election in 1884. It's actually a tremendously powerful image in that election, uh, in that uh, it, it is recognized as maybe one of the factors that, that helped defeat Blaine. Uh, essentially, Blaine is shown as a Roman senator in the Roman Senate, uh, and his toga is being lifted from his body, and underneath are tattooed uh, his various political sins. Uh, and the senators are looking uh, aghast uh, at, at his uh, 
political uh, misdeeds being revealed. And in the midst of, of that crowd are his running mate, uh, John Logan, General Logan, and also a uh, young Teddy Roosevelt as well. Mm -hmm. Now the Mulligan letters were his defense. Uh, was it a successful defense and does history really record whether or not in fact he was corrupt? Well, I think actually the Mulligan letters were the accusation as opposed to being his defense. Yes. And he tried very hard to make them seem as if they had no value. I read something about him slamming them down on the desk and daring people to read the letters. And once he had stolen them from whoever had them in the first place, he went yeah. to the hotel and said, let me see the letters. And then he took them with him and, you know, disappeared with them and never returned them. Um, so he, uh, he tried to use them as the way to protect himself, but I don't think there's any clarity that he was uh, not guilty. I think it's pretty clear that he was, uh, somebody called him Jay Gould's um, handyman or Jay Gould's um, uh, busboy or something to that effect, that he was so cl tight with the railroad industry that was unlikely he was innocent. And they continued to dog him. I mean, in the 1884 campaign, someone published what was believed to be a version of the Mulligan letters in a pamphlet, and he, he, he never quite uh, resolved that in his career. Right. Right. Well, we're going to involve some of our viewers in our discussion of James G. Blaine, uh, 1880s America. First caller is from Roger, uh, who is watching us in Atlanta. Roger, you're on the air. Hi, how are you tonight? Um, Great, thank you. I just finished reading the recent biography of Speaker Reed, and for two people who were really powerful in the Republican Party, they seemed really dis you know, from the same place, they seemed really distant. Is that true, or uh, was that just a feature of the biography? Uh, no, I think you're correct. Uh, you're mentioning uh, Thomas Brackett Reed, who was born in Portland in 1839, so he's just a little bit younger than Blaine, uh, went to Bowdoin College, uh, and spent uh, his entire public life as a, as a congressman. Uh, he rose to be speaker, like Blaine was also speaker from 1869 to 75. Reed served in the late 19th century, the late 1880s, and into the 1890s. I think that uh, Corruption was never a question uh, in relation to Reed. Reed uh, was, I think, a, a very uh, totally honest, uh, forthright individual, person of great integrity. Uh, and I think in addition to that, um, Reed is ascribed uh, as a towering figure in the history of the development of the Congress, considered by many to be one of the three or four most influential speakers of the House in the history of the House, primarily because of his Reed's rules, his reform of the House, um, the the recognition that uh, the majority uh, rule had to had to be counted and had to be taken into account. Next caller is Jim, watching us in San Francisco. Hi, Jim. Uh, hi. Uh, I, I think you're right on the major issues here. I mean, it seems to me the country was going through a major transition from the old money having formalized uh, their ethical values, and then they're all tr we're transitioning the country with the railroads into big industrial corporations and raising money for corporations and uh, very different sets of values. And so the question is, you know, how could someone that was busy making all the deals and representing Wall Street maintain any kind of public reputation in this situation? Certainly, I think one answer to that would be that there was a great recognition of his sheer power and so he, because he was so powerful and could do so much uh, for the party and for its other goals, people could set aside, some people at least, could set aside his apparent um, very close relationship with the railroads and, and the industry. Next is a call from Sharon watching us in Portland, New York. Hi, Sharon. Hi. I want to thank C-SPAN for bringing this wonderful series. And my question is this. Um, did Mr. Blaine make any money before he went into politics, or did he come from a family that had money to begin with? Thank you. 
Good question. Um, Blaine came from a, a, a modest background. Uh, he was born in Pennsylvania. Uh, he started out as a teacher, and then uh, he, he married uh, Harriet Stanwood from Augusta, Maine. Uh, in 1850, there was actually some question about the validity of the marriage, so they were remarried again in 1851. Uh, and by 1853, uh, they were getting word from uh, her relatives in Augusta that there was a business opportunity for him to come back. And so uh, they relocated to Augusta in 1854. And from 54 to 58, um, Blaine was the editor of the Kennebec Journal, uh, which is still being published today, and he also was uh, involved editorially in the Portland Advertiser, which was a daily paper. And uh, there we're seeing uh, today's, today's issue of the Kennebec <laughs> Journal, it's, it's which is Maine's oldest continuous daily newspaper. Alive and well and still publishing in a difficult newspaper age. Mm -hmm. We're in the study in the Blaine House and looking at his desk from that time period. The newspapers of the time, uh, he was both a newspaper man and very involved in party politics. Right. It, that yes. was common? That would have been very common. I think it was one of the primary ways that politicians got the word out about whatever their policies were. Uh, certainly there was no television. People were very interested in, there was no radio, you know, no internet. Newspapers and public speaking were the ways that politicians operated. I think we also have to remember that newspapers were very partisan in those days. Right. And shamelessly and, so. And shamelessly so. Right. And self-admitted. And that a particular individual, a group of individuals, would start a newspaper not only just to report the daily news of their community, but also to promote a particular political view or a particular political party. So was his interest in the Republican Party, I mean, how, how did the newspaper business and the Republican interests intersect? Well, I think it's very interesting. 1854, the year that he comes to Augusta and becomes the editor of the Kennebec Journal, is the year in which the National Republican Party is founded. He's involved in that. Uh, other famous Mainers are, including uh, Israel Washburn, Jr., who becomes the first Civil War governor of Maine. Uh, and uh, the newspaper is very much aligned with that rise of the party in Maine. I'm going to take a telephone call from Washington, D.C. Uh, Marvin, watching us there. Oh, hi. Um, this, I find this um, series to be very fascinating. And I was wondering, how would... Um, America be different, or how would um, our country be slightly different, I should say, if um, uh, Mr. Blaine had become president? And then also, um, in terms of why we don't really hear about him in the history books, can you guys elaborate further on that? Great. Thank you for watching. Well, uh, how would the country be different if he had been elected? I'm not sure the country would be terribly different. If mm -hmm. I think perhaps McKinley becomes a very pro-business president in, what, 1896, mm -hmm. and, uh, and a Republican. Mm -hmm. And I think that if Blaine, and Blaine maybe would have brought that earlier, you know, change had he become elected in 1884. What do you think? Well, the, the only thing I'd add to that is that um, uh, some scholars have said that uh, Blaine, because of his personal magnetism, uh, would have perhaps been a, a great sort of figurehead leader for the country, uh, would have projected a kind of uh, image of confidence and of power uh, that uh, was, had really been, been lacking in, in, in recent presidents in that period, uh, and that he might have been the most important figure perhaps between uh, Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt. And Chicago is up next. Dave, you're on the air, Dave. Dave, are you with us? Yes, yes, surely am. Yes, uh, I just wanted to uh, mention that, if I am correct, uh, there was a comment about uh, Blaine that uh, Thomas Nance said uh, that his book, 20 Years of Congress, was also referred to as 20 Years on the Make. And uh, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the second well, thing was there that, is that. <laughs> that uh, I have to be a locomotive engineer, and uh, so the railroad connection has uh, some validity even today. There is a... Uh, a small town in West Virginia, uh, because it was a friend of Henry Gasaway Davis, who built the West Virginia Central in Pittsburgh, later the Western Maryland, and then currently CSX, uh, named Blaine, West Virginia. So he endures on the railroad in that way. And if I also remember correctly, uh, it's one of those things where you have to watch what people say in your favor, because did he not lose New York in one of his runs because he did not repudiate the statement of one Reverend Burchard, 
that people would not support a party, meaning the Democrats, whose antecedents were rum, Romanism, and rebellion. So uh, I guess that's right. sort of the lesson. Right. Very much so. Also. So thank you thanks for taking so much. my call. Yeah, actually, we, uh, thanks for watching. We, we talked about the rum, Romanism, and rebellion, but uh, 20 years on the make, huh? That's a great yeah. title. Well, of course, uh, Nast was probably the greatest Civil War and post-Civil War uh, cartoonist. Uh, the Harper's Weekly was his forum. Every week he created another fascinating and challenging political cartoon. Uh, and he just downright didn't like Blaine and excoriated Blaine in his cartoons. I think there also was another incident in the 1884 campaign where he went out to dinner while he was in New York oh, with this yes. incredibly wealthy bunch of yes. millionaires, maybe all the top millionaires in New York, despite the fact that New York and the country was in a great depression and, and sub struggling greatly, and he seemed to be completely blind to the inappropriateness well, of that. Well, that, that was the very day that he also uh, was witness to Reverend Burchard's speech. I, so. In the morning, he did Reverend Burchard. In the, <laughs> in the evening, he did Delmonico's Restaurant, which well, was the most fashionable restaurant in New York. And that was immediately reported to the press as Balshaz's Feast. Right, and I have yeah. another name, Boodle, the Boodle Feast or yeah, something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, before the presidential bids, 13 years in the U.S. House of Representatives during the period of Reconstruction. We're in his study again, and he's got his congressional desk in there and uh, the period of time of reconstruction where was he on the issues regarding reconstruction well it's interesting my sense is that he was largely a moderate which would have helped to make him provide some balm to the nation if they say he was quite successful in taking congress in one of the most difficult times of its history and smoothing a lot of feathers um, but he was also an early advocate of black suffrage, which I find quite interesting. That would not have been considered a moderate position. And uh, I think myself, uh, my sense is that that was more opportunistic than anything else, that he was among those who believed that black suffrage was important, not because it was important for blacks, but because it was important to give blacks the vote so they'd vote Republican and vote for him. He also had, we talked about his enemies, he had a very well-known enemy with a very publicized fight at that period, Roscoe Conkling. Mm -hmm. Who's Roscoe Conkling? He's a congressman from uh, New York. And can you comment on him? I can't speak so, so vividly about him either. I, I know that there was this struggle between the two of them. Which I, led to a historic fight on the floor of uh, the House of Representatives, Congressman from Utica. We have a, do have a clip about it from uh, the Senate historian, Don Ritchie. Let's listen. At that period, the two leading Republican politicians were Roscoe Conklin, the U.S. Senator from uh, New York, and James G. Blaine, who was a U.S. Senator from Maine. Uh, they were both dynamic. Uh, they were both articulate. Uh, they were magnetic personalities. Uh, you know, the, just attracted lots of people to them. They could give a speech to a convention, just knock the convention you know, out of its minds. They were so terrific on the stump and in, uh, in, in any kind of oratory. They were legislative geniuses. They battled out in the Congress in the 1870s. And, and, so. and they hated each other with an absolute passion. Uh, no two political figures probably have hated each other as much as Roscoe Conklin and James G. Blaine. And it was partly because they were about the same age, the same ambition. Uh, they knew that one or the other of them was going to stand in the way of, of the other getting to the White House at some point. And their rivalry started back when they were in the House of Representatives in the 1860s. And uh, Roscoe Conklin was a, an enormously proud, vain uh, man, very handsome, uh, dressed to the nines, and uh, strutted about in a way that uh, made some of the rest of the members uncomfortable. And, uh, and so maybe I might have uh, uh, sort of kept it out of the way of this man who never had a particularly good word for anyone. Uh, but James G. Blaine, who was a, a young upcoming politician from Maine, wasn't afraid to take on anyone. And in a debate at one point in 1866, he launched into one of the most savage attacks on another member of Congress imaginable. Today, under the rules, you really couldn't attack another member that way. But it was full of sarcasm and with allusions to uh, uh, the uh, Hyperion curl that uh, Roscoe Conklin had and to the turkey gobbler strut in which he walked around. It was terrific. It was, it, first off, it made all of Conklin's opponents laugh at him because it was all true. 
Secondly, it gave tremendous amount of ammunition to the editorial cartoonists, because from then on, they were always uh, making uh, uh, poor old Conklin into a turkey or into some other figure. <laughs> <laughs> was Senate historian uh, Don Ritchie and what you're looking at on your screen is here in the Blaine House in Augusta, Maine and uh, the uh, Blaine study that is actually a chaise lounge from the Capitol from the Senate uh, that is uh, preserved here in a house that's very much in use. Uh, interesting listen to the characterization of there. I mean politics we think is colorful today but turkey gobbler strut and other things that right. people used to say to one another. Was it widely reported in the press? How did these stories get passed along to us? Well indeed uh, the, the, the press was very lively in those days as we've already said. It was so very... Did it sit it was in the very, galleries of Congress and capture oh, this oh, stuff? Oh very much so and then of course the, the way in which the information was translated uh, to other uh, newspapers around the country was through the telegraph and stories would be written and then they would be telegraphed to, to other papers and then copied in some cases from other papers as well. We have another politics was entertainment. I, I mean I think there was much about it that was not just about the politics but about the entertainment value that it had and, and great mm -hmm. writing and clever phrasing and, and before so there were big sports teams that's right. Right. So right people followed politics right. uh, next is Helen watching us in Cape May New Jersey Helen you're on hi this is a wonderful series thank you so much all of my students are watching so they're going to be tested I hope they're paying attention uh, but I have, well, we, have, <laughs> <laughs> we have teachers here so they're glad you have students involved uh, I have a question about the uh, Blaine amendments, uh, that he, he tried to have an amendment to the Constitution, and many states adopted the Blaine amendments. Um, was, was there an anti-Catholic motivation, or was there some other motivation that went along with this? More than 20 states have Blaine amendments, even though it was yeah. not successful on the national level. I what think was it might motivation? even be close to 40. I thought it was it's something th like it's 30 th It's 37. 37, yeah. Yeah. wow. Yeah. Yeah. The Blaine what amendment was do? an amendment that he proposed that would prevent schools from uh, using federal fund religious institutions from using federal funding, if I'm not mistaken. And that's still in place today. And that's still in place, a sort of separation of church and state. Yeah. Uh, do you know if it ever had a Supreme Court challenge? Uh, as, uh, I mean, it says as it made it way, its way through the courts in these states, as we've discussed the separation of church and state so often in this country? Yeah, I'm not, sure. not sure. I don't know yeah. that it has. Why do we it's still know secure. about Blaine Amendments then? Oh, wow, that's an interesting question. Maybe because there are attempts, not from the Supreme Court side, but from individuals who are constantly trying to challenge that separation, I would mm -hmm. imagine. Mm -hmm. What motivated him in putting it forward? Well, I think that it, it was 1875. I think he may well have already had his eye on that 1876 election and may have been opportunistically picking an issue. And I'm not beyond thinking that there was an anti-Catholic component to it as well, since those were the institutions, the Catholic schools, that would have been most likely to be trying to not pay taxes or use federal funding. Mm -hmm. What was Blaine's religion? He was a Congregationalist. But he had uh, a Catholic, did he have a Catholic parent? Yes, his yes, mother, his mother yes. But uh, no, he attended um, the South uh, Parish Church here in uh, Augusta. And in fact, uh, there are beautiful um, Tiffany memorial windows to he and other members of, her fa of his family in that church. We have a viewer from D.C. calling us next, named Rom. You're on the air. Good evening, uh, Susan. Hello? Yes. Oh, hi. We can uh, hear you. Thank, thanks for, um, thanks for uh, hosting this series. And I, I have been watching C-SPAN for many years, and all the programs have been so great. I just want to say thank you first. Um, so uh, my question goes uh, to the uh, Chinese Exclusion Act. And um, at that time, I believe that most New England Republicans were against the Chinese Exclusion Act. Uh, because they tend to be more, they tend to be more liberal, uh, and they uh, were not on board uh, with that. Uh, but but Blaine started out uh, supporting it with the Southern Democrats, and I wonder uh, what gives. Like why why was he not so liberal in terms of civil rights at that time compared to the other New England Republicans? And uh, I would what? like to learn about it. Thank you. 
Well, I think, I think again, it's, it's, it's similar uh, to Elizabeth's recent answer on another issue, and that is that this is a man who always had his eye on the presidency, and in order to win the presidency, uh, you needed to do it uh, from a nationwide perspective. And I think he recognized, particularly in the West and especially in California, that Chinese immigration was a major issue, uh, and uh, he wanted those votes. So what I'm taking away from this is that this is a man, you said he wanted that presidency desperately, that, that was not uh, ideologically driven so much as had his finger to the political wind? I think that that is certainly one way to interpret his political career. And I think when I think about the pro-black suffrage policy at, and think at the same time about the Chinese Exclusion Act policy, I, I find it hard to bring those two together. If he was racially progressive, then why would he not be racially progressive on the other side? So that's an indication, I think, of a sort of um, opportunistic approach and very ambitious. And whatever will win me the election. Morristown, New Jersey. Ed, welcome to the conversation. Good evening. Uh, was Blaine so obsessed with the presidency that he considered himself a failure for not having attained it? Thank you. Thank you. That's an interesting question. It is. Um, I don't think we get that sense. Uh, I think what happened, you know, he, he went through the process three times, 1876, 1880, 1884. He was also, you know, it was kind of dangled in front of him in 1888 and again in 1892, even though he was then a very ill man. But I think he felt toward the end of his life that his really great accomplishment was that uh, second term as Secretary of State uh, between 1889 and 92. And there he was able to play out a lot of his ideas, not only on the national scene, but on the international scene as well. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think he viewed his uh, career as a failure. You're watching C-SPAN's Contender Series, a special series for this fall. We're going to take a very short break and tell you about more about this series. The Contenders, and our look at the life of James G. Blaine, continues live in a moment. The Contenders features profiles of key figures who've run for president and lost, but changed political history nevertheless. For more information on our series, The Contenders, go to our website at cspan.org. There you'll find a schedule of the series, biographies of all the candidates, historians' appraisals, and portions of their speeches when available. That's all at cspan.org slash the contenders. We now return to Maine and our discussion on the life of James G. Blaine. And you're looking at a live picture of the James G. Blaine House in Augusta, Maine, the state capital. And it is now the official residence of Maine's governor, has been since 1920. We are live tonight inside the governor's mansion, a guest of the governor and his family, to learn more about this house's longtime owner, James G. Blaine, unsuccessful presidential aspirant three times, uh, won the nomination in 1884 failed to win the presidency and yet made a mark on this country that we're learning more about tonight. Our two guests joining us, Earl Shuttleworth is Maine State Historian and the Director of Maine's Historic Preservation Commission and Elizabeth Leonard, History Department Chair at Colby College and a specialist in Civil War America. We're taking your telephone calls and let me give you the phone numbers and you're welcome to join in the conversation. We're getting great questions tonight. 202-737-0001 for the Eastern and Central Time Zones, 202-737-0002 for those of you watching in the Mountain or Pacific Time Zones and we uh, welcome your uh, involvement in this. Tell me about um, Maine, uh, a, bit, a little bit more about Maine in this time period. We talked about earlier on about him coming here as mm -hmm. a young man. Uh, how difficult would it have been for him to establish himself? Mm -hmm. How welcoming was it? Well, I, I think that uh, he had a very good connection with his wife's family. Uh, the Stanwoods were a prominent family here in Augusta, uh, and actually that connection for him to become the editor of the Kennebec Journal was essentially made by 
family and friends uh, who, who wanted uh, his wife back here and also wanted to make that opportunity available to him as well. Uh, and he came really at, at a perfect time, the, the 1850s, the decade just before the Civil War. Uh, Maine is really at a zenith of, of prosperity. I mean, there is a, a recession in the late 1850s, but generally speaking, uh, Maine is, is really cresting in both its economic and its uh, political f force at that time. Last week, we were at the home of Henry Clay. Uh, were there connections between James G. Blaine and Henry Clay? Uh, there were in the sense that he had grown up in a house where Clay was absolutely idolized, and it was an, Clay was an idol for him as well. And when he was a young man, he spent some time in Kentucky, actually, and working as a teacher, and he made the point of seeing Clay whenever he could when he was in Kentucky. Uh, and so he was, he was a very devout uh, fan of I Clay. think there's one account that at the age of 17, he attended one of Clay's major speeches in 1847 and took copious notes on it. <laughs> our next caller in our discussion about James G. Blaine is from Indianapolis. This is Edward. Hello, Edward. Hi, how are you? Great, thanks. Our next caller Your question? Uh, what was the role Ed of Blaine as uh, Secretary of State under uh, Benjamin Harrison? Okay, uh, if you do that briefly, because we're going to spend a little bit more time later on on uh, Secretary of State. Uh, he's served under three presidents as Secretary of State, is that correct? Right, yes, Garfield, Arthur, and then Harrison. And the Harrison was the long period. I mean, the Garfield was just within less than a year's time, about nine months. But uh, with, with Harrison, he was really in a, a wonderful position because he really had reached uh, the zenith of his career. Um, he was viewed as as powerful, if not more powerful, than the president himself. Uh, and he had this free reign to be able to develop ideas that he had been working on for years in terms of international relations. And his particular interest uh, during the 1889 to 92 period uh, was Central and South America. And he developed, uh, including the idea for the Pan American Union, and so on. That's right. I want to get more involved in that a little <laughs> later on. Let me ask you about, uh, in the study here, there are a few memorabilia pieces connected with Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. uh, what would his, obviously was the supporter of Abraham Lincoln, what, what, did he know him that we know of? I don't know that he knew him personally. He had met him? Yes. Um, uh, of course, he went to, uh, to Congress. He was elected to Congress right. in 1862. Right. And so he would have served um, in Washington from 1863. And Lincoln, uh, of course, was assassinated on April 14th, um, 1865. There's a very poignant reminder of his connection with Lincoln here at the House. And that is that there's a little card, uh, literally, Seven days before Lincoln is assassinated, Blaine went to uh, Lincoln to get permission to visit Richmond, Virginia, which had just fallen, the capital of the Confederacy. Uh, and, and we know from other instances that um, he would have had opportunities to meet and, and talk with Lincoln. We also know that he was so uh, an admirer of Lincoln uh, that uh, when he built uh, the addition to the house in 1872 for the study, uh, he wanted to use the very same wallpaper in his study that Lincoln had used in his cabinet room. And we're showing that wallpaper to people as you speak on the screen. Yeah. And that, that was the card that you saw. So I believe it's a replica. That is, yes, uh, that's it's, right. The original. It is a permission slip to travel to Richmond, exactly. which would have been necessary at the time. Waterville, Maine. Glad to have a Maine person involved in the discussion. Alexander, you're on the air. Uh, yes. I was wondering what kind of other attacks Blaine used against Cleveland aside from the claim that he had a child born out of wedlock. Thanks. Thank you. As far as I know, that was his primary uh, mm -hmm. uh, personal attack against him. But of course, there would have been political attacks against him as a Democrat and a representative of the party that had fomented the rebellion and, and so on. How mm. scandalous would it have been in this time period for someone to have a child out of wedlock? Oh, I think it would have been quite scandalous. Yes. I would think so, too. Yes. Yeah. And. Uh, just to answer that question a little more, there were um, nuts and bolts issues 
to, to the campaign of 1884. And one of the strong issues that the Republicans and the Democrats differed on in the post-Civil War period uh, was the tariff, you know, how, right. how much to, to tax goods coming and going. Uh, and, and the tariff was, was, was a major uh, factor. And I believe currency was also a, yes. getting to be oh, a major oh, factor. Oh, very much so. Also, and had so. been since the Civil War because, of course, the Civil War had proliferated uh, the use of paper currency. Right. And so the whole issue of greenback currency right. uh, was very much in the 1870s and 80s a political issue. And into issue. the 90s. Yeah, right. exactly. And then right. it kind of gives way to the free silver issue. Right. Yeah. Houston is up next, and our caller's name is James. Hello, James. Uh, hello. James, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Oh, okay. Well, uh, he said that he mentioned the Civil War governor, governor, and I just, the first Republican governor was actually my great great grandfather, Hannibal Hamlin. And I wonder what mm, his connections yes. were with Blaine. And um, uh, uh, additionally, uh, I think the rift with Conklin might have cost Blaine New York and might have cost him the presidency. So some of his uh, pulling of the lion's tail came back to haunt him, I think. Hmm. Thanks for your contribution. So Hannibal Hamlin and the relationship. Hannibal Hamlin uh, was quite a bit older than Blaine. He was born in 1809 on Paris Hill in Oxford County. Um, he was a highly skilled lawyer uh, who had served uh, as uh, governor of Maine briefly and then became um, a senator. Uh, and then in 1860, he's chosen as Lincoln's running mate for vice president and serves as the vice president of the United States from 1861 to 65. And then after the war, uh, he goes back into political life again as a senator. So he would have been very much a part of Blaine's world in the Republican Party in Maine. Uh, Hannibal Hamlin was uh, a, a powerful, a towering figure in that period, and uh, he would have interacted constantly with Blaine. And he was someone who stood against Chinese exclusion. He was a Republican who stood against Blaine on the issue of Chinese exclusion. Elizabeth Leonard, I'd like to have you, since we're in a period of time where you uh, hear people bring up the question of uh, maybe it's time for a new party. Uh, that the two-party system is failing us and the like. And this was a period when we saw the evolution of political parties from the Whigs to the Republicans. Would you take just a minute or so and explain about the demise of the Whigs and the rise of the Republicans? Uh, I think the demise of the Whigs is very much associated with the person you were talking about in your program last week with Henry Clay. When Henry Clay died, that was very, he was so closely linked to the Whig Party that the Whig Party really collapsed. But it wasn't just about Henry Clay, it was also about the slavery issue and the anti-immigrant issue and, and a number of other issues that led to the development of this sort of political chaos which gave way to the Republican Party but also the split in the Democratic Party over the course of the 1850s. We love to introduce you to books, and uh, our guest uh, Elizabeth Leonard has uh, just seen today the first uh, day. Just seen the first brand copy new book. of this my new book, her, her fifth book. And uh, take a minute and tell us about this character that you're writing about here. Joseph Holt was uh, Lincoln's Judge Advocate General. He was a very important figure in Lincoln's administration. He was the Chief of Military Justice. After Lincoln was assassinated, he was the prosecutor of the Lincoln assassins. And anybody who's seen the film. The uh, conspirator. <laughs> uh, anyone who has seen that film, The Conspirator, has seen a representation of Joseph Holt, which is more than I could say before that film came out. But nobody knew who he was. Now some people know who he was. Well, congratulations on its publication. So It'll be available. Now we're in a historic house, and it is. <laughs> You know, it's funny because it's not the top of the hour. It's a couple minutes early here, but the clocks are ringing, and you will hear a couple of them at the at this uh, at top hour here as we get into the uh, second half of our program. Uh, let me take another telephone call. It's from Michael, watching us in Tampa. Um, I think your show's uh, wonderful. I appreciate um, the historical commentary as well as the. Um, interviewer's commentary. My question is, can we put forth some personal commentary relative to Blaine's experience and time um, as uh, compared in, to today's political landscape? What do you mean? Uh, uh, just give me a little more of what you'd like. Um, I, I think Blaine represents something that's pretty um, um, dominant in, in the American populace today, but it's not being representative. And um, I think Blaine was 
I'm very inspiring to hear about this tonight, actually, and I'm I'm just curious of, of uh, maybe some personal input from all three of you relative to um, that landscape of then and versus today. Okay, thanks very much. I'll ask both of our guests to talk about that. Well, I have to say I'm not quite sure what he's looking for. <laughs> I, I, I guess if, if you're asking whether uh, I think he's a politician, perhaps, who would be recognizable today, I guess maybe I would say, it's, I would think that he might be kind of recognizable in his ability to know the political system, to manipulate the political system, to be a real career politician. Mm -hmm. He's a certain type. Could he have competed in today's, let's do a then and now, <laughs> could, he, could a person with his characteristics been successful in today's political world? With, oh, his, I, 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 with his charges of corruption? Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> What would be different about that? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, Good, good question. Uh, I, I think, though, he, he had a lot of personal skills that, that, that probably would, would stand him in good stead today. I mean, clearly, uh, to be an, an effective uh, leader, you, you, you need to uh, uh, have a, a charismatic personality. You need to be able to get your, your message across well. Uh, and these are things that, that he did very successfully. And also, uh, he really understood uh, the behind-the-scenes working of, of, of the political scene, uh, really from the 1850s right into the 1890s. We talked about the media being uh, so supportive of parties at the day. Would it, uh, it was someone who had persistent charges against him. Were there investigations by the media at the time? or Oh, certainly. Oh, sure. They were looking into it. But I, I think even so, today we investigate people's corruption all the time, and they still proceed with their careers. So, Phoenix up next. This is Josh. Yes, hi, good evening. Uh, great show. Good evening. Um, I'm, I was particularly, uh, like your guess that they could comment on um, Mr. Mr. Bl Mr. Blaine's uh, foreign, policy, foreign policy thoughts uh, as Secretary of State. Uh, what, what his opinions were? Did he go abroad? I'm spe specifically interested in South and uh, Central America. I was born in Cuba and during, uh, towards the end of the 20th, uh, 20th century, you know, we, the Cuban Revolution was just starting, and I was wondering if Mr. Blaine ever went to countries outside of the United States and what his opinions were on colonialism, say, like uh, by Spain or other countries, and, and if he did anything about or had any feelings about those types of issues. And it's a great show, and I'll, uh, I'll uh, hang up and listen. Thank you. Thank you. And your question is so timely because it's time for us really to spend some time learning about his years as Secretary of State. We said earlier that he served three presidents. And some historians suggest that if we, we look at Blaine's legacy, it's really in the area uh, of international affairs. Uh, so can you speak to his Surely. influence and then answer his question about whether or not he left the country? Sure. Well, maybe I'll, I'll take the first one first, yeah. if that's okay. Sure. Uh, we, we, I don't believe that he went to Central or, or South America. But I don't Europe, think, I know. But Europe, yes. Europe. Uh, he, he traveled several times to Europe. Uh, in the period between the time that he ran for president uh, and the time that he became Secretary of State in the mid-1880s, uh, he spent quite a bit of time in Europe. Uh, some of that time was actually with a very close friend of his, uh, Andrew Carnegie, in Scotland. Um, I, as, in terms of his uh, significance as Secretary of State, the development of the policies, as we've mentioned before, they were, they were really primarily focused uh, on uh, Central and South America. And uh, this was a really very progressive thing to be doing in American foreign policy. Um, those areas had, had largely been ignored since the days of the Monroe Doctrine. Um, he was very concerned uh, that Britain was having an unusually strong influence on some of the countries, particularly Argentina, that many of those countries were fighting among each other, uh, and he felt that in order to have a strong and safe America, uh, you also needed to have a strong and safe uh, neighbors to the south. Right. Before you uh, answer, we have another of the political cartoons that you yes. brought, which is 
Titled The Old Scout, what's it about? Yes, uh, this is a pro-Blaine campaign um, piece. Uh, it's from the judge, uh, and it shows Blaine as an old Western scout on a, on a horse uh, with an old tattered hat. Uh, and uh, he but look at is... all the peoples of the world looking at him. Yes, exactly. This is Blaine, a Secretary of State. Uh, this dates from around 1890. Uh, and he's actually leading uh, the people of Central and South America uh, into a new world. He's, he's giving them leadership. And in many ways, this is reflecting um, his pioneering work in creating uh, what became the Pan American Union the opportunity for people to meet uh, diplomatically uh, in, in both hemispheres. Where would he have gotten these ideas from? Well, I think it goes back to the Monroe Doctrine. I think yes. he was very much trying to revitalize that older image of a sort of hemispheric unity and also hemispheric defense. Uh, something that I find interesting is this notion that he did feel that the Monroe Doctrine extended as far west as Hawaii. Yes. <laughs> and uh, he, he had his eyes on Hawaii, even though he was talking about perhaps hemispheric integrity, he also had an imperialistic strain yeah. to him, wouldn't you say? Well, certainly the, the Hawaii episode, of course, this is at the very end of his life, and he doesn't even actually live long enough to see Hawaii annexed, but he sets it in place by sending uh, his old friend, John L. Stevens from Augusta, who was uh, involved with him in the Kennebec Journal way back in the 1850s, and he sends him as his special diplomatic emissary to Hawaii uh, to basically foment revolution. <laughs> Uh, one of the quotes from a historian I wrote down that Blaine envisioned an influential America based on its increasing wealth. Right. So you mentioned uh, that uh, he really had an American-centric view as he was doing this, even as he was yes. reaching out. And very much, you know, he would have been very supportive of the notion of the consolidation of capital and the growth of American wealth and its expansion around the world. I think. Now, the interesting thing, we had a, a caller much earlier on ask about Thomas B. Reed, and there was a very strong difference there between Blaine and his worldview and Thomas B. Reed, who actually resigned uh, from the House after the Spanish War because he was so concerned about the imperialistic direction that he perceived America going in. And so there were, there were very differing views in America in the late 19th century about the direction of the nation uh, as a world power. Right. He was serving under President Benjamin Harrison. Yes. How strong a president was he? Uh, I think he was generally perceived as a fairly weak president and that Blaine was actually uh, the shadow president. Mm -hmm. And this is certainly reflected uh, in a lot of the popular uh, literature and cartoons again. I actually read a similar sort of thing about him when he was Secretary of State for Garfield. Yes. That he was also, people, the, the author was defending Garfield as being powerful in that relationship, but he was defending it against a long tradition of people saying that it was really Blaine who was running the show then as, as well. Wisconsin Rapids, Wisconsin. This is David. Hi, David. You're on. Yes, uh, I was wanting to know, um, the, with him being progressive, Republican, the, did he have any influence, or was there any fingerprints that he put on uh, Wisconsin's uh, political party that would become progressive uh, at that time period, and up into the you know 1900s, 1910s, and all the way 1930s, that there's uh, a lot of policies that uh, we still live by, you know, workers' comp and, and uh, workers' rights. Did, did he have anything to do with anything or any influence at all with uh, influencing anybody in Wisconsin? Thank you. Not that I'm aware of. No, I think we're talking there about the next generation of politics. Uh, we're talking about the Teddy Roosevelt era, the progressive era from the early 1900s. Uh, and indeed, uh, the reforms that you're talking about that Wisconsin is so noted for, uh, and reforms that also extended to other states as well, are post-1900 usually. Yes, and I would think that he would have been very pro-capitalist. You know, if we're talking yeah. about workers' rights and so on, you know, he was at Delmonico's with the millionaires. He wasn't meeting with the laborers to see how they felt about things. Bangor, Maine. Uh, this is Bruce. You're on, yes. Bruce. Yes, hi. Uh, could you give, give us a, a, just a brief history of of the house that you're in about uh, how the state of Maine was able to acquire that from the Blaine donation and, and also uh, Mr. Blaine's death in Washington DC and his subsequent burial like 20 years later back in Augusta. 
All right, I'm going to ask you not to talk about the death now because we're going to show a little bit of his, sure. uh, his gravesite. But uh, about this house, please. Yes. Well, I think I mentioned a little earlier, the house was built by a retired sea captain from Bath, Captain James Hall, in 1833. Our state house right across uh, the street had just been finished in 1832. So for Hall, as for Blaine, this was a really strategic location for a home. Uh, the house was acquired uh, by Blaine and his wife in 1862. He died in 1893, she in 1903, and then uh, the house was uh, uh, really inherited by their surviving children. Then uh, in uh, the 19-teens, uh, the house went to uh, Blaine's grandson, Walker Blaine Beale. And Walker Blaine Bill was tragically lost in the last month of World War I in 1918 in France. And so the house went back uh, to uh, Harriet Blaine Beale again, uh, and she in turn gave it to the state of Maine in 1919 as our governor's mansion. Uh, it was restored and remodeled uh, so that it could be used as the home of Maine's governors. Uh, and Governor and Mrs. LePage are uh, the 21st family uh, to live here uh, since 1920. Let me introduce you to uh, another gentleman we'd like to bring into the discussion. Uh, and uh, let me show you as we start out here a biography he's written of James G. Blaine. Neil Rold is joining us. His book is Continental Liar from the State of Maine. Uh, a, a campaign slogan used against James G. Blaine, of course. And Neil Rold is joining us from inside the Blaine House, the Governor's Mansion. Uh, Mr. Rold, how, how did you get interested enough in James Blaine to write a biography about him? <clears throat> well, basically, um, I, uh, I've been involved in this house since 1966. I was an assistant to the Governor Curtis, so I knew all about the Blaine House. And then later on, another governor, Angus King, asked me to be the co-chair of a group called Friends of the Blaine House. So I was spending a lot of time here. And I noticed, you know, there was a little bit about Blaine here, but there really wasn't very much. And there was no up-to-date biography of him. Uh, the, the previous biographies were about 70 years old then. There'd been two of them written in the 1930s, early 30s. So. Uh, I thought it was high time that this fascinating character who came within a whisker of being President of the United States should have another biography, and that's how I got involved. Now, you said fascinating. What are some of the other adjectives, descriptive words you'd use to describe James G. Blaine? To, I'm sorry, would you repeat that? Uh, what, what are some other words you would use besides fascinating to describe him? Well, the one that they used a lot was magnetic. And they called him the magnetic man because he had a magnetic personality. And apparently when he uh, would walk into a room, he just filled that room. Everybody sort of flocked to him. And uh, so he was sort of a natural in that, in that regard. I know you've been listening to our conversation. Do you have a favorite James G. Blaine story that we haven't told tonight? Oh, boy. Well, I didn't hear everything that you said. Um, I was uh, going to start by uh, talking about uh, the, the first time he was uh, Secretary of State. And I don't know how much you got into his relationship with Garfield. Well, that's all right. Just tell us a bit about it, please, that we need all to All right. Know. Well, uh, Garfield was like a protege of his. Uh, in fact, he, he helped him get through a real tough patch down in Congress when Garfield was accused of corruption. Uh, and of taking some stock that he shouldn't have taken. Uh, he got him out of that. Uh, they were just very close friends. But in 1880, when Blaine was running for the second time, and uh, he kept uh, Ulysses Grant from uh, getting the nomination, but again, he didn't have enough force to, to get the nomination for himself. So he, he turned it over, he turned his votes over uh, to Garfield. And that's how Garfield, who was a very dark horse when the convention started, uh, happened to end up as the Republican nominee. And the sort of quid pro quo was that the number one job in the cabinet was to be Secretary of State. And so it was sort of understood between them that he would become Secretary of State. Let's take another telephone call. We have about less than 20 minutes left in our 90 minutes on James G. Blaine, Hillsborough, Ohio. This is Chris. Hi, Chris. Hi. 
Uh, I'm curious about Blaine's relation with Thaddeus Stevens and uh, Charles Sumner, uh, both radical Republicans uh, before and uh, during and after the Civil War. Um, the relation with Sumner might be particularly interesting since Sumner was chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Thanks very much. Um, I, uh, oh. th is that something you can take, Mr. Roll? Well, I could, I could take a shot, particularly Thaddeus Stevens, because Blaine made a name for himself when he first was elected to Congress by taking on the doughty uh, Thaddeus Stevens, who everybody was afraid of, and, uh, and contradicting him. And uh, I don't know exactly what his relationship with Sumner was, but Blaine was not a radical Republican. He, wasn't, he was a moderate in that regard. Uh, he still wanted to um, build the Republican Party in the South, and that's why he was so strongly for uh, suffrage for the, for the uh, freed slaves and, and for th that part of Reconstruction. But he was not for, you know, tremendous punishment for, for the South that some of the radicals were. Our callers are here for our three guests as we talk about the life and times of James G. Blaine unsuccessful nominee for president in the 1884 election and uh, Grover Cleveland was the successful candidate but we believe uh, that he had an outside influence outsize influence on American history and we're learning more about that tonight Woodland Hills California you are on the air yes hi um, hello Eric hello how are you continuing on uh, about the uh, about James D uh, Blaine's personality um, I was wondering um, He's certainly a larger-than-life character. Do you see him embodied in any current, current uh, politician? Thank you. <laughs> well, let me uh, ask um, Neil World briefly, and then I'll ask our two guests if they see him embodied in any, giving him a little time to think about it here. <laughs> um, no, I don't think so. Um, he, was, he was considered a very congenial person. And, of course, he came from away, as we say here in Maine. <laughs> And he came up here uh, as a young man and immediately was accepted by the people here because he was so good with, with people. And uh, uh, so he was sort of a combination of, of various people that we have now. But I don't see anyone that um, has his intellectual depth. Uh, he was a very bright guy. He was very well read. I was just reading about his going to parties in Washington and being described as uh, being surrounded by all the, the women there because he was reading them poetry. <laughs> <laughs> it gets us all the time, right, Elizabeth? <laughs> uh, have either of you thought of comparisons to today? I thought of Bill Clinton, actually, although I don't see the, you know, it, it, certainly in some ways that kind of great personal mm -hmm. style, mm -hmm. larger than life, very commanding. I, my understanding of Bill Clinton is that when he walks in a room, you know, he just sort of takes center stage without mm -hmm. even trying. And a great orator, too. And a great, and, and yeah. great, and very bright. I mean, yes. clearly a very yep. intellectual figure. The other person, um, that I thought of was Lyndon Johnson in terms mm -hmm. of his being a party man and knowing everybody and knowing how to gather people together to do what he wanted. And also how to work the system. And how to work the system and a little yeah. corruption here and there. Yeah. A little yeah. Gulf of Tonkin. You know. <laughs> we are live inside the Governor's Mansion in Augusta, Maine. We have about 15 more minutes on James G. Blaine, Falls Church, Virginia. Sean, you're on. Hello. Um, good evening. Uh, I was wondering, was there any, was there a residence in Washington D.C. on Dupont Circle, and was there any connection between uh, Mr. Blaine and um, the Southern Railroad? Okay. Uh, we'll we'll take it in here, Neil. Thanks. What, what, what was that uh, about? We, it? Yeah, we, we'll take it in this room, Neil. Uh, what, a residence in Washington D.C. Yes. Um, in in 1881, uh, when uh, Blaine became Secretary of State. Um, he decided to build uh, a large Gilded Age mansion on DuPont Circle, uh, and that house is still standing today. Uh, and uh, it was a house that he only kept for a few years, 
Uh, and then, of course, in the, in the post-1884 uh, election, he and his wife traveled a lot. Uh, it was at that same time, after giving up the Washington residence, uh, that they built uh, another big Gilded Age uh, Victorian summer cottage here in Bar Harbor, Maine. Uh, then, when he became Secretary of State uh, for the last time, um, he actually acquired Secretary of State William Seward's house uh, near, the, near the White House, near Lafayette Square. Uh, and that's the house he died in in 1893. And had he, all, he had sold the DuPont Circle yes, that's house correct. at that point. Yes, that's correct. Yes. I mean, he, he was there for a very short time. He had one of his daughters was married there. His wife hated the place. Uh, it's absolutely mammoth, oh, and it's still standing on Massachusetts Avenue. 2000 Massachusetts Avenue, now, not it, Northwest, if, if you're in Washington, D.C., interested in James G. Blaine and would like to see that period of his history. Just uh, about 12 minutes left, and Pittsfield, Maine is uh, up next. This is Stanley. Hi, Stanley. Hi. Yes, I'd like to know, uh, are there any books that either Elizabeth or Earl may recommend uh, for reading in regards to uh, Mr. Blaine? I would suggest the book that you're holding right there. And if you want to know about the time period or about the state, in addition to this, Earl, uh, some other books you can recommend? Yes, well, first, I would agree. Uh, Neil's book uh, is the most recent, the most up-to-date, the most comprehensive understanding of Blaine. You have to go back to the 1930s to find uh, two biographies of him previous to that. Um, as to state history, um, actually, uh, Neil, Neil also is an author to turn to there. He's done a couple wonderful overview histories of the state of Maine. Mr. Rold, you're getting a lot of Valentines in this room here. Well, good. <laughs> now, I'm, Keep I'm, it up. <laughs> now, while, while we're talking about houses, uh, in your book, uh, The Continental Liar from the State of Maine, you describe the scene when uh, James G. Blaine learns that he is successful in attaining the Republican nomination in 1884, and he goes to the front door of this house to greet uh, to his supporters. Will you tell us about that time? Well, actually, he was... When, when the news first came, um, the people were gathered down on Water Street, which is right down by the Kennebec River, uh, around the post office. His, his uh, biggest crony, was, Joe Manley, was the postmaster down there. And they, they were putting up signs, you know, how Blaine was doing, how he was doing. And finally, uh, uh, they, uh, they uh, put up, you know, that he had, he had got, gotten the nomination. Also, the Blaines had a telephone, and they were probably one of the first in the nation to have a telephone. So the phone rang, and his daughter Maggie uh, picked it up and learned that he'd won, and she ran out into the front lawn where Blaine was lying in a hammock. And, <laughs> and she told him, you've won, Father, you've won. And uh, so that was, that was how he learned the news. And then everybody marched up the hill from Water Street to... Uh, come up to, uh, uh, to greet their hero, and a huge crowd gathered, and uh, then it started to rain. And, uh, and one, of, one of the, you heard a voice yell out from the crowd, we've been waiting 11 years for this rain to come. <laughs> <laughs> and so Blaine said, you know, they were all getting soaked, but he, he gave a speech then, and then then everybody started pouring in here from all over the country. And they had a train come from California, which had the California delegates to the Chicago Convention, all plastered with Blaine stuff. And people started coming from all over the state of Maine and, and all over the uh, uh, United States. And, uh, so, and then John Logan, eventually, they called him Black Jack Logan. He came and spent a few days here with, with Blaine. I want, to th uh, I want to thank you for adding to our rich knowledge of James G. Blano. And one more plug for your book as we say goodbye to you, because our program is running out pretty quickly here. Continental Liar from the State of, of Maine. It is available wherever you buy books. You'll roll his, our guest as part of our program as we learn more about this very colorful and very influential man from the 19th century, known not only across the United States, but around the world. Topsail Beach, North Carolina. Douglas watching us there. You're on the air. Yes, how are you? I would like to ask your historians if uh, what Blaine's 
uh, relationship was to Joshua Chamberlain, who was a uh, Civil War general and later governor of Maine after the Civil War. He was a Republican, and what what was their uh, relationship? Well, of course, um, as you mentioned, uh, Chamberlain served uh, four terms uh, right after the Civil War, and uh, Chamberlain was a very independent individual, uh, and uh, he was not comfortable uh, with Blaine's brand of politics. Uh, there is, I think, fairly ample evidence that they did not get along that well. They were not close uh, compatriots in the party. Uh, and in fact, uh, Chamberlain did not go further in politics after the governorship. Uh, he rather became president of Bowdoin College and then later on uh, collector of the port of Portland. We had a caller that uh, mentioned uh, the town that was named for James G. Blaine off the railroads. We did just a little bit of research, and there might be more, but we found a number of cities and towns around, uh, counties rather, and towns uh, around the United States named for James G. Blaine, mostly in the time period after his death. It, was, uh, uh, it seemed to be, um, can you talk a little bit more about honoring people, uh, especially James G. Blaine, through naming the, uh, the communities that were growing up around the country? Well, one of the things that I thought of when I heard that or when I, when I learned about that is that I, I thought about the fact that several of them are out west. And I thought about his whole push for the Western vote in the 1879, 1880, hoping to build that through Chinese exclusion. And I thought, well, maybe he really did win some, <laughs> some favors out West because I don't know if there's any connection, but it was interesting that this uh, Republican figure from Maine, well known in the United States, but nevertheless out West, clearly there was some support. Washington State and Idaho to be right. particular. San Francisco, up next, Jim. Hello, Jim. Uh, hi, thanks. Um, most of Blaine's uh, history was during Reconstruction. Uh, he was a moderate Republican, but can you nuance a little bit uh, to what degree he negotiated or supported the reassertion of power by Southern whites? Well, I, I'm sure that he would have said that he stood firmly against the reassertion of power by Southern whites, but he was a moderate and he was in line with those who believed that the nation should move forward and that the radicals were really holding it back. And of course the radicals were in favor of punishing the white southerners, and the rebels, as best they could. And um, I, I don't think it would have been in any way uh, good politics for him to have stood up for white southerners, but I don't think that he was really strongly going to take the position that they should be Punished. In that regard, Elizabeth, could I ask you, what's the incident with his sponsoring the bill that would exclude citizenship uh, for Jefferson Davis? Right, right. In uh, 1876, when he was throwing his hat in the ring for the presidency, he sponsored this bill that said that all of the, um, hold the remaining Confederates, former Confederates who were... Uh, no, who had not yet been given amnesty should be given amnesty except Jefferson Davis, which was interesting. <laughs> and how would the politics of that resounded with the nation? Well, it provoked a great fight in Congress, and people felt, some people thought it was great because they believed that he should, in fact, you know, this idea that you would still hold Jefferson Davis accountable was really great. Others thought that uh, Blaine was doing what they called waving the bloody shirt again, and here the nation was moving away from the war, and reconciliation seemed to be moving forward, and why was he provoking this kind of dispute again? We have about five minutes left. Independence, Iowa. This is Joe. Hi, Joe. Hi. Uh, unlike Joshua Chamberlain, Ulysses S. Grant, uh, William McKinley, um, Blaine had no uh, military record in the Civil War, but his running mate, General John A. Logan, uh, had one and was the first president of the Grand Army of the Republic, that great uh, uh, Republican organization throughout the states. And, and Logan gave us uh, Memorial Day, uh, Decoration Day. Um, can you just speak to the fact, was that a ticket balancing move in some sense, or did it uh, in part uh, cover the fact that Blaine had not served? 
Well, I think there's no question but what that was uh, a political balance on the ticket. Uh, Logan was very well known. Um, the veterans vote uh, was a very powerful force in the post-Civil War period in America. Uh, Blaine, because he was very much involved in an emerging political career, when the Civil War broke out, he was Speaker of the House here in Maine uh, in our uh, Maine House of Representatives, uh, and he was about to run for Congress. Uh, so he did what many men did at the time, and uh, he actually uh, uh, bought a substitute. Uh, it cost about $300 to have someone else go in your stead. Um, Cleveland actually had done the same thing. So it was a very interesting situation that prior to the 1884 campaign, uh, you always had someone in office in the presidency, uh, Grant uh, and Hayes and Garfield, um, who had been uh, Civil War officers, but uh, Blaine and uh, Cleveland were not. So who, whichever one of them had won, it would have been the it first It would have been a, a break in that, uh, in that generation, mm -hmm. yes. We had a viewer who asked about his death, so will you now tell us the story of his death? Yes. Um, well, uh, as, as has been mentioned, um, he, he was a man who uh, was prone to, um, to illness all through his life, uh, I think both real and imagined. Uh, there was always mention that he might have been more hypochondriac than, than uh, reality. But by the same token, uh, by uh, 1892, um, he was exhausted both physically and mentally uh, and in fact uh, the campaign of 1892 was looming uh, there was some talk of his being nominated for president uh, but uh, he really wasn't up to it and and he bowed out he gave only one speech uh, during the campaign on behalf of the re-election of Harrison and then early in 1893 uh, he died uh, at his home in uh, Washington where is he buried buried here in Augusta originally buried in Washington uh, as was his wife, and then uh, the state of Maine uh, brought Mr. and Mrs. Blaine's remains back to Augusta, and they reside uh, in a beautiful Blaine Memorial above the cemetery here in Augusta. How long did his wife live after him, do you know? Uh, until uh, 1903. She lived another 10, ten years. years. Uh, we have very little time, but we have a local caller. Augusta, Maine. This is Jonathan. Yes, uh, this uh, question might be uh, answered by Earl uh, Shuttleworth there. Uh, what was the relationship of uh, Mr. Blaine towards the uh, native population of the state, I mean Native American population, because we know there were natives uh, uh, in the Civil War, had their own regiments and whatnot down in the south. Uh, can you, Thank you, uh, Jonathan. I'm going to jump in because our time is really short. Big question, but a short time. Yeah. I. I I'm not sure that uh, I have a quick answer for that. Is that right? Yeah. So uh, any place to go for that? Is there material available in Maine's historical? Well, I would definitely uh, look to, to uh, Neil's book right. to start out with. We'll, we'll and uh, also the, the State Library, very good reference at the State Library. Um, I'd like to close. We have just uh, really a minute left and ask you the question, support our thesis. What was the legacy? What's the importance to America today of James G. Blaine having been the politician here? I think his his influence as Secretary of State was very important. It's a great legacy, and and his desire to build some kind of cohesion between the North American and South American, Central American states. I think there's that, and I think also if you look back across his uh, long career in public life, uh, it is that he is one of the key. Uh, builders of the Republican Party in the 19th century. Um, he's there at the beginning in 1854, uh, and he's still there almost 40 years later as probably their most powerful and most identifiable figure. And for what it's worth, Maine today has a Republican governor and two Republican senators, and congressional delegation here is Democrat. Is that right? Correct. Yep. Oh, the de congressional Democrat. Yeah. But I was thinking our state legislature is all Republican, too. Well, we are out of time. I want to thank a number of people as we close here. First of all, uh, Governor Paul LePage and the LePage family for hosting us at the Governor's Mansion tonight. And uh, Paula Benoit it is the director of the Blaine House here, and the staff has been fabulous to us as we've been setting up over the past couple of days. We really do take over the place, and they've been wonderful. The Maine Historic Preservation Commission, thank you for your help and historic research, and also to our cable affiliate, our wonderful cable affiliate here, Time Warner Cable of Augusta. 
uh, for all of their help and support in bringing C-SPAN to this community. We're going to close the program just the same way we opened it. We're going to give you a look at uh, the campaign memorabilia and particularly listening to a group called the Independent Silver Band as they sing an 1884 Blaine Logan victory song. Thanks for being with us tonight.